Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to get started in about two minutes. So if you could just make your way to your seats and settle down, that would be um, very helpful. So thank you. I have to say, this is a beautiful room. As the chairperson of CLASP Board of Trustees, I am delighted to welcome you all in attendance here at the Gathering Place, as well as all of you who are tuning in live stream to our event. I want to especially thank our local partners who are the co-hosts for this amazing event, Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, the United Way of Greater Atlanta, Opportunity Youth United, Audra Cunningham, the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, all of you for your support and partnership. I also want to thank our speakers in advance, Ian Bridgeworth for his advocacy and partnership. And I want to extend an, a real special thanks and gratitude to Congresswoman McBath from the 6th Congressional District here in Georgia for making time this afternoon uh, from a very busy schedule to join us in this very important conversation. <laughs> I'm a, I've been with class for over 10 years as a board member and most recently as board chair. What really makes this organization unique is its unwavering commitment to combating poverty, injustice, systemic racism, listening to those with lived experience to create pathways to economic security for all. CLASS sits at the intersection of federal, state, and local policy. And with trusted advocates and deep analysis, we really seek to push for investments and public policies that will create lasting change. Would all the members of the class staff that are here please stand or wave so we can recognize you. I want you to know that class staff have been fearless in fighting against the efforts to cut safety net programs that protect and support families, children, and individuals living in low-income households. Fearless and bold enough to advocate in the midst of all of the devastation that we hear about to help get increases in programs that matter. 
and at the same time, boldly collaborating and advocating for sound policies that will provide a pathway of opportunity in ways that matter. Our leader, Olivia, I recall when we first met after this administration uh, came in with the board, and we were fully aware of the intent at that time to dismantle and strip programs that support families, children, and individuals living in poverty. And we had a conversation about it, and we urged you and the staff to fight back. And you've shown tremendous courage, focus, and leadership and resolve, and have fought back and won some fights to stop the kind of harm that could happen. So we are so thankful for what it is that you're doing. And during this conversation today, you'll hear a little bit about some of the work from CLASP um, on the discussion panels as we listen to and gain insights from the work that's being done here in Atlanta. In today's hostile political environment where low-income people face greater threats than ever, the work of CLASP and local partners such as you uh, will hear from today has never been more important. The South presents unique challenges and opportunities. I'm from Birmingham, where hoses and dogs were turned on children who marched against segregation in education and public accommodations. Because, though, of segregation, the South led the way fighting for civil rights and equal opportunity for people across the nation over 50 years ago. Yet even today, are tied culturally to fundamental inequities and in access to jobs and capital and resources, provide an opportunity again today to provide leadership to the nation by fighting against divisive policies that further divide us in an unprecedented wealth gap. Young people today have less rather than more opportunities in America. And that is why this conversation that will take place today about young people, equity, economic mobility, and justice is critical to this country and this region and the state. During this program, we invite you to join in the conversation by following us on something that I'm learning about Twitter, at CLASP underscore DC, using the hashtag, hashtag youth equity GA, hashtag CLASP at 50. Before I introduce one of my fellow board members, David Dotson, I want to acknowledge as well one of class' newest board members, Jamira Burley. Where are you, Jamira? <laughs> Jamira truly represents the spirit of class advocacy for the past 50 years and is helping to bring new energy and vision to where we're headed. Jamira was named a White House Champion of Change and has been internationally recognized as a social justice advocate for change. We really appreciate the work that she's doing with CLASP. And now I'm going to introduce another fellow board member who's a fellow traveler on the board and has been on this board for over 20 years. And that is David Dotson, who's president of MDC in Durham, North Carolina. He's been with MDC since 1987 and he, first of all, brings immense intellectual capital to his work across the South and the nation's leading uh, major projects that address how philanthropy can effectively address poverty and reduce disparities. He is so well respected for his work and his publications are really the gospel for those seeking a deeper understanding of social disparities and workable solutions. I value his insights and friendship. So David, would you come on up? Wow, it, everybody should come up here and see what it looks like <laughs> to see this fabulous crowd. Um, I'm David Dodson and as a longtime board member of CLASP, it's a pleasure to um, provide another Southerner's welcome to this phenomenal organization, which I hope at, at the end of this gathering, everyone in the room will come to understand and know, um, and know better. 
This is really a meeting of, um, of the wonderful talent of the South and of Atlanta with the wonderful talent of CLASP. And when great people and institutions meet, um, I suspect wonderful things will happen. I love the title of this program, and I think we're going to have a wonderful um, opportunity to both elevate the significant challenges that we face as a region, challenges for which the South is really in many ways ground zero, the challenges of economic mobility, particularly for youth and young adults, um, for justice, and for equity, to examine those challenges, but more importantly, to begin to explore the innovative solutions that are being forged by partners on the ground, informed by the kinds of ideas and research that CLASP is able to provide. Economic mobility for youth and young adults is a national challenge but it is most pronounced here in the South. Here in this region, the chance that a child born in the bottom 20% of the income distribution will live in poverty, himself or herself, is twice the nat national odds. In other words, there is an anchor on upward mobility for young people in the South that is serious and pronounced. We really can't talk about having an American dream as long as that anchor persists. And it persists, as many of you know, particularly deeply here in Atlanta. Equity, the unfettered opportunity for a fair chance at a healthy, rewarding, secure life is still an illusion for too many people in the nation and particularly in the South, the poorest region of the United States. And then justice. While the nation has a serious problem with over-incarceration, those rates of excessive incarceration are again most pronounced in this region that I and Levita call home. These issues aren't going to change overnight. They really require a shift in three things a shift in mindset. First and foremost, we have to throw away the old ways of thinking that emphasize scarcity, exclusion, and fear, and embrace universal well-being and opportunity as the ethic that guides policy and practice. And then we need to focus on those two things, intelligent policy rooted in equity and practice that puts that policy into action. CLASP is actively working on all three of those things. By changing the narrative, CLASP changes the way people think about the future. By changing policy, CLASP puts in place the frameworks for a world that is more just. And by informing practice on the ground through partners, CLASP helps bring ideas to the ground where they can actually touch the lives of people and transform them. Change does not happen overnight, and we'll hear about that here. But if we despair about the present, I think the work of CLASP and its partners gives us enormous hope for the future. So thank you for being here for what I hope is both a sobering and a hopeful gathering. And now it's my um, joy to introduce um, our last warm-up speaker, Audrey Cunningham, a friend, a patron, and an advocate for the work of class. Um, Audrey, where are you? Please come. Please come forward. Welcome us to your home officially, and thank you for your support of class. Good afternoon and welcome to Atlanta class. I cannot be happier that you are here, that you're here and you're right. Everybody's so beautiful. Uh, my name is Audra Cunningham. I'm with Physicians Realty Trust and I am standing before you today as a big supporter of the Center for Law and Social Policy. 
It is my humble privilege to welcome you as we are here to recognize the Center for Law and Social Policy's 50th anniversary. As I ponder past 50 years of awe-inspiring advocacy, I began to think of the inequities, discrimination, oppression, and predatory practices that have confronted poor people and underserved communities over the past 50 years. As I consider the social challenges and injustices over that, of that 50 year period, it provided me with the context and greater appreciation for the purposeful, essential, life-changing work that CLASP has engaged in since the organization's inception. What does CLASP do that is unique? CLASP has a strong commitment to make policy work and systematic change for our youth and people of color. As a donor, it's nice to see things that have such an incredible impact and have such an incredible impact and CLASP does from making, from working on increasing historic federal investments for childcare to promoting healthcare access and paid family medical leave that is so important. They also focus on not just current threats, but offer vision for what is equitable society should be. Real value add for everything I believe in. They understand Washington and they understand our local communities. Do you know how rare that is to be able to find an organization like that? To have people in Washington that get it? Yes, <laughs> we're so happy you're there. <laughs> That is why I support them today, tomorrow, and forever. Won't you? As we celebrate the extraordinary work CLASP has done, giving voice to those who are all, who are all too often overlooked and marginalized by the forces of hypercapitalism, materialism, and racist, racism, notwithstanding the proud accomplishments of the past 50 years, class work is far from over and more critical than ever. Evidence that occurred just this week with the current federal administration's continued efforts to dismantle the Consumer Financial Protection, Protection Bureau, which was expressly created to protect Americans, dare I say, poor Americans, from predatory lending. As I take my seat this afternoon, I offer the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that were written 56 years ago on this very day, April 16th, in 1963. Written in Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, I offer these words as a call to action for each of us individually and as affirmation that class mission and core values that have guided the organization for half a century are relevant beacon to serve humanity's causes for the next 50 years. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutually tied and single garment of destiny. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I welcome you all to support CLASP as I do, and I thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Welcome to Atlanta for those who joined us today. We're really excited to have you. Um, this room feels really good. It's a room that feels very hopeful, uh, very um, the right people around the right conversation. Because we know when we look at this topic of economic mobility, equity, and justice for young people in our region here, that we're not in a good place and that there's much work to be done. And conversations like this are the ones that are gonna move us forward. I'm with, my name is Leslie Grady. I'm with the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. And we are a philanthropy in town that is committed to inspiring philanthropy to address this issue of equity and opportunity. We do that through grant making. We're a foundation. We also do that though by partnering with amazing folks in this region like United Way, like uh, GBPI and others who are in this work because we know that it takes all of us working together. So I have the opportunity to introduce the panel. Um, I want to begin with Congresswoman Lucy McBath. And so I'm so honored to be introducing um, Congresswoman McBath who represents Georgia's sixth district. 
in the U.S. House of Representatives. Congresswoman McBath has been a Georgian since she arrived in Atlanta to work for Delta Airlines more than 30 years ago. After years of advocating for her community as an activist, she decided to do something about it and to run for Congress. As many of you know, that decision to run for Congress was motivated in part by personal tragedy. She was elected to Congress last November amidst a class of new representatives that ex exemplify the diversity and the passion and the promise of our nation and of our region. Since being elected, she's defended the Affordable Care Act, promoted sensible gun legislation, and joined efforts to protect our democracy in introducing a bill that ensures officials properly carry out their election duties. And her being here today indicates her support and commitment to uplifting Georgia's youth and paving the way for the next generation to come. So please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Nicole. So next I'm going to introduce Ian Bridgefoot, who um, I just teased him earlier, has become just a rock star. We met Ian, well, maybe it hasn't been two years, a year and a half to two, um, one day in our offices, and he was talking about this um, burgeoning youth advocacy and youth voice, youth driven voice organization for this state and around critical issues around accessing and completing post-secondary education, as well as issues related to um, criminal justice. And we started hanging out and doing a lot of things together and watching that organization as it mobilizes and speaks with and on behalf of young people is truly uplifting. Um, his interest in, Ian's interest in politics was sparked at Georgia College and State University during an internship with Congressman John Barrow. And then after graduation, he went on to a career in public relations and the nonprofit sector here and in New York. But he was inspired to create Georgia Shift when he moved back to Georgia and saw a huge disconnect between the political campaigns and organizations that existed and young voters. And we know that that's where it all happens. And so through Georgia Schiff, his goal is to give young people across the state a platform and a voice for their issues. And to show them that they don't have to wait for anyone to get permission to become active in their communities. So welcome Ian, come on up. And now a firecracker named Keisha Bird. Anybody ever experienced Keisha Bird? <laughs> so Keisha Bird is class director for youth policy. And the youth policy team seeks to advance equitable youth policy investments and the rebuilding of a vision created with young people in the pursuit of safety and well-being. Good talk. What Keisha does is a tireless advocate and voice and passion for young people, as represented in this room and in every room that she um, goes into. Specifically, she's um, an expert in federal policy and helps to ensure that national legislation has maximum impact for particularly for youth of color and opportunity youth in local communities. So we clearly have an amazing panel and we're gonna get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Keisha. Right, thank you. Right. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for being here, and um, thank you to all our speakers who offered remarks on behalf of the work that CLASS is doing, but now we really want to get into the conversation that is really about, one, what is, what is at stake, right, in the South um, and for our young people? Two, what can we do about it? What can we do about systemic change, about mobilization, partnering with young people? What can we do about dismantling the barriers created by policy and rebuilding those, um, those opportunities through policy? And what are we gonna collectively commit to doing together? I wanna invite everyone who's um, joining us via live stream to join us in the conversation. Follow us at class. Um, underscore DC using the hashtag Youth Equity Georgia and Class at 50. So um, I'm going to start with you, Congresswoman. I'm so happy that you're here. We've been following you, all of us. We feel like your family. You've been tireless advocate 
um, and, and a voice for all of us for, for many years. And now you are representing the Georgia Six. So we, let's, let's, let's celebrate that. <laughs> let's celebrate that. So um, I, I, I was reading an article, and it was before your election, and, and um, I was struck by a quote in there. And, and what you said was, um, I'm risking the legacy of my son for this district. You also were wearing and it's been part of your mantra that you are a fighter, a mother, a Democrat. So um, as we talk about this conversation of justice, of equity, of young people, where do you see your role now as an elected member of Congress? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I started simply as a organizer and movement builder after Jordan was murdered. Uh, for sensible gun laws, sensible gun changes. And so what I began to understand over the course of the years is that I had spent a lot of time building this external movement, mm -hmm. um, really standing up. And my, I was very intentional about bringing to the forefront this public health crisis of gun violence. Um, you know, I just watched Trayvon murdered, and then only nine months later, my son murdered the same way. And so it just started me being an advocate, speaking out about our extremist gun culture. But along the way, beginning to recognize that even though I was helping to shift and mold and change this gun violence culture and the movement building, the organizing around it, that it took more than just activism to change the culture, and that we were going to need people on the inside that could help expedite the changes through policy. Mm -hmm. And as organizers and activists and mobilizers, yes, that work helps to shift and mold the external movement, you know, laying the groundwork in our communities and across the nation but you have to have champions on the inside that can create the legislation and the policy that has to be voted on, and that's how you expedite the change. Because what I'm do it's a cultural shift and change that I'm trying to put forth. And cultural shifts and changes take time. Mm -hmm. As it was stated earlier, it, it is a process, and it takes time to change the culture. So expediting the change, making sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to keep our communities safe, keep our families safe. And that is the reason why I decided to stand up. I decided to stand up right after Parkland because those children were the same age as Jordan. But as I know that there have been scores and scores of children of color that had been dying in their own community schools for years, and that up until this point, that had never been addressed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is the reason why I stood up, because I recognize that our children had been dying disproportionately for years before, but now that this, this culture has, be, it has gone beyond the confines and the boundaries of the minority community, and now it has reached the, it has reached the entire nation. No one is immune. Yeah. So I want to follow up with you on that. Um, as we, you, you talk about this has reached everyone and no one is immune. When we specifically talk about young people of color, our African American youth, our Latino youth, our indigenous and native youth, our Asian and Pacific Islander youth, there's a, a narrative, and amid, oftentimes a negative narrative, around who our young people are and what they can achieve. So how do you think we begin that shift and um, that narrative change so that everyone can see our young people as, and, and the beauty of their humanity to, to act, to move, to, to support them? Um, it's a great question. I have great responsibility to be able to do that as a policymaker. I sit on the Judiciary Committee as well as Education and Labor. So it's my responsibility as, um, as a policymaker to make sure that we are addressing these very things in our hearings, making sure that I'm shedding light, even in my testimony, talking descriptively about the very institution of discrimination and racism that follows our children, that follows our family, uh, our families, and bringing light to those very systems in in the hearings, in my own testimony, speaking to those that are um, before me, 
and just continuing to, to be a voice, mm -hmm. continuing to be a voice to make sure that our children are educated, mm -hmm. continuing to be a voice to make sure that our families and our children are never to be in fear of being gunned down simply because of who they are, continuing to be a voice, making sure that our children and our families have access to affordable health care, which is everyone deserves that. Mm -hmm. So just these very policies, standing up and descriptively making sure that I'm putting forth the effort to either co-sponsor legislation or sponsor this very le kinds of legislation that protect our ability to live in the country the way we're supposed to live and not be disparaged or, or, dis or disproportionately discriminated against because of who we are as people of color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Ian, as we heard in your um, intro, and in in, in, um, you returned to the South. Yes. You are a son of the South, and you returned to Augusta, yes. right? And so um, while we're talking about young people, we know, I don't know how many of you know out here, that the millennial generation is our most diverse generation yet. It's folks who, yes! <laughs> Um, there, there's youth and young adults who've been were born roughly between 1980 and 2000, right? They represent about 30 percent of the voting age population. Uh, short, few short years, uh, 2025 will be 75 percent of our working population. Do y'all know what that means? How are we educating our young people? How are we arming them and supporting them with the knowledge that they need to thrive and also to, to contribute to the democracy and the fabric of our communities and our country? Tell us about Georgia Schiff. How are you doing some of this work locally and in the state? Uh, so, you know, we are a civic engagement organization. We do uh, voter engagement, issue advocacy, and leadership development. Um, but where we're evolving and, and moving into is, is really at our core is in, yep. can you hear me? Um, really investing in people and we're investing in young people and, and pouring into them. And I say that in the fact of, you know, I, I'm only one person, we're only one organization. If we're not pouring into people, young people and, and investing in young people, what is this going to really, really look like? And so our goal is how do we in, on internally and also externally like make sure that young people have the tools and resources to move forward. Um, one example would be last year we did canvassing. Um, so yes, we're paying them $15 an hour, but the question, the issue is like that's what we're supposed to do. That like we shouldn't get a pat on the back or something like that. Like what else are we doing besides paying them 15 an hour to go knock doors and things like that? And then really looking at these structural issues, not even just on a policy level, but also on a systematic level where for instance, locally, our county commission meets at 2 o'clock in the daytime, where it's like, okay, who has the time to really come to a county commission meeting at 2 o'clock in the daytime? And so it's how do we increase access and make sure that everyone has access to this opportunity instead of lobbyists or real estate developers and other things like that. And so really focusing on you know, the policy issues, but also how do we remove all of these barriers to make sure that everyone has access and they know, okay, if for you have a pothole issue, you're not going to go talk to Stacey Abrams. You're going to talk to the person, your county commissioner, and just making sure, like, you know, everyone has access to their numbers, and, and even um, knowing what issue I need to, to, I would say even um, engage as far as okay, my I'm dealing with public transit, and sort of do I deal with the the bus authority or those kind of things, um, and that's probably the biggest thing as far as focusing. How do we really invest in them so that way? When I'm long gone, they are they still have the tools and opportunities to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So um, pulling on a little bit of that, so really demystifying, right? Mm -hmm. What what does uh, policy look like? What does um, civic engagement look like beyond protests? It's a little bit of what you're doing. Um, you are working on a couple of issues. Um, we know higher education and access to post-secondary is um, out of many of reach, even if you get accepted or even if you have a pathway, even if you have a high school diploma, it's not affordable, right? And we also know that the criminal justice system is pervasive it is structural, and it is chasing down virtually our, our young people, our young people of color. So what are, what are you doing um, to tackle some of those issues? So uh, a couple of things. I think um, one of the things on the criminal justice side of things, we 
we're, I think Georgia is one of uh, three states who still charge 17 year olds as adults in our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, and so right when you're about to either go to school or, or graduate, um, you're being put in jails with uh, with adults that are 50, 60, 70 years old. And so it's there are a whole host of issues that we're dealing with with that issue. And now see even access to higher education. One of the things that we're looking at even now are, you know, yes, you can get free college, but in addition to free college, like high school is free, but there's still equity issues all throughout the K through 12 education system. And so it's issues like uh, child care, transportation, uh, food insecurity, those kind of things. How do we make sure that we're addressing all of those things instead of just saying, hey, you have free college? Mm -hmm. that's, 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 those are good things. Um, there's a number of campaigns around the country about raising the age, right? So that we will not try uh, young people as adults. And um, so that's some work that folks in this room can really jump on. Follow your other state counterparts. New York has raised the, raised the age recently. Virginia and other places are really working to do that. So that's one key takeaway. So Congresswoman, turning back to you, um, and we're trying to get the sound right back here. Um, uh, you already told us that you're on the House Judiciary Committee, um, which is a really important role, um, and also the House Education and Labor Committee um, with uh, Chairman uh, Bobby Scott. Yes, and he's a friend to our work um, and, and to young people from around the country. So as we think about some of these kind of key policy issues of is raising the age and workforce development um, and pouring into young people and investments they need, what are some of your priorities and what do you think some of the priorities of those committees should be um, this Congress and moving forward? Well, most specifically, um, education and labor, which I sit on, really making sure that every child, every individual, every young person has a fair start. They deserve that. Uh, I will tell you just from experience, I can remember when I was raising Jordan as a single mother. I remember that the school in our neighborhood, I was newly divorced and, you know, really just trying to knock on the doors in the, in the neighborhood to find out how many children were there, how many families had kids that were Jordan's age, wasn't really paying attention to the school system. The school system that was in uh, his middle school that was in our district was a Title I, Title I failing school. And of course, you know, I've had him on all the lists, you know, trying to move him into other various schools, public schools, and you know, the No Child Left Behind law did not work, as it did not work for many, many families and many, many children. So I had the blessing and the fortune to be able to homeschool my son. But not every family has that opportunity. And that struck a very deep chord in me that how is it that we are living in such an industrialized nation with so much wealth and our own children are suffering from undereducation? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that was very disconcerting to me. And so sitting on education and labor, I can make sure that we are doing things such as strengthening and expanding Pell Grants. You know, making sure that our children, our young people have the ability to be educated in the ways that they deserve. Making sure that they're not saddled with debt, you know, while they're trying to get their college education. Making sure that it's, we're finding easier ways for them to find financial assistance. Making sure we're finding easier ways for them to actually, actually apply. I mean, these are things that I can do as a policymaker to continue to bring to light, you know, many, many young people in this country that you just think it's just an automatic thing for people to be educated, but it is always not the case. And so my responsibility is to make sure that our children, our young people are invested in. I'm particularly interested in making sure that we're appropriating funds to two-year colleges and institutions and also our technical training schools because not every young person has decided that they want to go to a four-year institution that's perfectly fine but to be able to become entrepreneurs to be able to invest within their own communities really supports and structures our economy so that they're not forced to go outside of the state to find employment and so these are things that I can do. These are things that I can help make sure that we're putting policies and laws in place to protect 
our students' ability to thrive and to have the global education that they deserve because they have to globally compete. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and before I turn it over to uh, ask you another question, Ian, um, just want to invite everyone who's online as well as in the audience, we're getting ready to get to questions. So you have note cards on your tables, so be jotting down your questions. And if you are online, you can tweet to at class underscore DC. Um, so, Ian, as we um, talk about um, being prepared, right, being, um, being uh, ready, right, 75% of the, of the American workforce, right, um, we talked about social capital, we talked about human capital, and how um, youth-led organizations are so critical to that. Um, share a little bit of a story, an example of how Georgia Shift is working to do that right here in the state. So, one of the... Um this last legislative session, one of the bills that we were focusing on was a bill that was trying to allow more retired police and, and other authorities to be in school. I mean, so we, in, in K through 12 schools, and so it's what we felt like was the idea of more police in schools were, was not the best idea and was also was going to be detrimental to um, their success and even post-secondary success. And so um, our work was trying to make sure that we can to be honest with water down this as much as possible so that way um, that young people aren't sitting there and, and being basically placed in the school to prison pipeline much easier than they already are. Um, and so that's pretty much like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so things like that are sort of what we're looking at even locally, like in Augusta, they just closed. Uh, for schools, and so the schools that they close are people who look like us, and so it's like, where are those kids going to go? What's going to happen to their pi uh, pipeline to uh, post-secondary success? And things like that. It's like, how do we make sure on the on the local level, on the state level, and even on the federal level, like all of this stuff is connected? And how do how are we really organizing uh, at every level of government? Excellent. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yours is working. Okay, let me speak to that. Education and labor. I had the opportunity while well, my work <laughs> last week. We had uh, Secretary DeVos, Betsy DeVos, come in and she actually spoke and testified before Education and Labor. And I, I challenged her specifically because within my district, 6th Congressional District, we have Argus. And Argosy is one of the institutes that has been clo is closing beyond all hope of redemption. And I had the ability to be able to challenge Secretary DeVos under her leadership how she would allow the receivership of that institution and many more institutions around the United States to close. And all those People that were getting those young people that were getting you know their master's degrees and their PhDs and getting degrees put their hard-earned money down to get those degrees to be educated and under her direction I guess turned a blind eye knowing that those schools were going to close and so this is the very reason why I know I'm sitting on education and labor, to protect against those kinds of things, those tragedies from happening. And I just, it was very unconscionable that that would happen because under her, I mean, the receivership under her, she is in charge of you know, educating our children, not privatizing our schools but making sure that every young man and woman in this nation has the ability to be educated. And so I'm so glad that you brought that up because that is the reason why I know I'm sitting in Washington to help our children have access to affordable education and the same education that they deserve across the nation. They should be getting right here in Georgia as well. All right, let's say amen on that. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're. Um, Talking also um, about equity, right? This is what we, we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, access is equity. Um, investments is equity. Um, you know, seeing our young people um, as 
just any other young people? Can, can our young people thrive? Can they just be kids? That's equity. Um, but Ian, what do you say equity is to you and to the work that you're doing? What does it look like? So uh, a little story. Um, about a year ago, I was in DeKalb County. I got a ticket. The ticket was, uh, I think, $360. And so um, the first thing that, that thought in my mind is sort of, what if I didn't have the money to pay this? What would have happened to me? Um, the other thing is also, you know, I was trying to pay it online, and they told me that I had to come in and pay it, like, in person. And so if I didn't have a position where I could leave and do that, like, not many jobs are going to allow you to do that. Um, I would even add on to that, like, if they gave me a ticket or they stopped me and say, you know, well, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Or, and okay, so there's a whole host of issues, like just me getting a ticket. Um, and I was able to get it uh, paid and everything like that. Um, but I think about, as part of the reason why I think about public transit as a criminal justice issue, where if we had access to robust public transit, all of this could have been mitigated. Um, and then also on the criminal justice side of things, the less opportunity for cops to stop young black and brown people, the better. And so making sure we can invest in it, not just even on the, I know there was issues um, sort of getting it through the state with MARTA, but even in Augusta where how do we make sure that it has, like public transit is, is accessible to everyone. Um, and so that's just on the criminal justice side of things. That's not even on the environmental side. That's not even on the access to jobs or access to um, opportunities for uh, fresh food and vegetables, things like that. And so equity is how do we make sure that, that we're putting in policies and also um, making sure the process is as easy as possible for everyone to, uh, to be able to fight for those policies and make sure that they um, can get what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Congresswoman, so we know um, far too many uh, youth and young adults are living in poverty. Um, if you're a young parent, one in four are living in poverty and raising children. Um, across the country, we have over 4 million young people who are out of school, out of work, not by, you know, something that they want, but by they've been pushed out of opportunity. And so as we think about equity, what does that look like if you are successful in your role as an advocate in the inside now? And what does it look like in partnership with all the folks here in Atlanta um, and, and in uh, Georgia? Making sure most assuredly that you have access to good and affordable health care. Making sure if you are an individual such as myself that has a pre-existing condition, and by the nature of being a woman, we are a pre-existing condition. <laughs> but making sure that people that have pre-existing conditions have the ability to pay for the cost of their treatment and pay for the cost of their pre prescription drugs. Making sure also, too, that we are allocating funds for medical research, specifically to do things like study maternal health, which many, many women of color, we know that disproportionately women of color are dying in the most powerful and wealthy nation in the world during childbirth. Making sure that, as I said before, our children have access to good education. That is their right. They cannot globally compete without it making sure that each and every young person at the age of 18 has the ability to vote, yes. mm. has access to the, to, the, to the ballot box, no obstruction to the ballot box, that they are able to exercise their right to choose and say what's important to them in their futures. And for those that are incarcerated and once they have done their time and they come out, making sure that they too have their voting rights restored. And just making sure that we have clean drinking water, clean air to breathe, all of the things that we should be afforded, that's what justice is. That's what, that's what, that's what playing, putting everybody on a level playing field is. And that starts with our young people, that starts with our youth, building that in our communities, making our communities stronger, our families healthier, and a lot of that I have the responsibility of doing in Washington as a policymaker. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, that's that. So, um, be thinking of your questions. There'll be someone coming around, taking them, and once again, for those of you online, you can tweet at class underscore DC. 
So um, I'm going to ask you both a question uh, and, and, and an action step, a charge, because you want to leave this audience and the folks who are uh, watching online. What would you say to them? What's your charge? Don't think you need more experience. I think doing the work is, is, is having that experience. Say that again for the people in the back. Don't wait for people to tell you you need more experience. I think even myself, I, I wasn't going to start this organization until 2017 because I thought I needed more experience on a presidential campaign. But uh, just going through all the stuff that to build an organization, that's experience enough. And you don't have to wait in line. Um, that's just more people telling you because they are intimidated by you. And so um, whatever you're looking to do, just go do it now. All right, so just go do it now. And Congresswoman, what is your charge? Whatever you believe in your heart is important to do, waste no time and do it. Time is short. And we are at a very critical juncture now in society. Very critical time. And what I say is that now some people said to me, well, I don't know how to do what you do. You don't have to do what I do. Do what you do. Take the skills and the talent that you have been given by God. Use those for someone else. You are good enough. You are strong enough. You are smart enough. You have everything that you need to be successful and viable in creating change. That's what this is, stimulating change. And it doesn't happen with one person. It happens with all of us. So be engaged. Be engaged in your communities. Be engaged in making sure every single day that someone outside of your circle has the ability to live freely the way they're supposed to live. You can do that. You don't have to, you don't have to run an organization. Yes, you do. It's wonderful that he started this great organization, but you just do what you can do and know that you have the, the power. Be empowered to do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so we are going to, oh, we have a lot of questions. Well, we don't have time for all of those questions. But um, know that we'll be continuing um, to uh, this conversation um, as this is a part of class ongoing work. And you already heard the Congresswoman that this is a part of how she's representing this region, um, this state. Um, on, in Congress as a part of um, her roles on the House Judiciary Committee and House Education and Labor Committee. So I will take the first question, Marlene, if you are ready to give it to me. Yes, okay. All right, so um, this is a very specific question and um, in, either one of you could take it. You already started by talking about Pell Grants, um, but besides uh, make, uh, making uh, Pell Grants more uh, accessible, what policy can change um, can we do to make post-secondary education more affordable? Uh, I can I can speak to I think you have to attack it through, um, and the students we deal with, you have to, have to attack it through so many other ways, I think, besides like just having the free tuition. I think that's great. I think how do we make sure that people have access to housing and, and transportation and, and child care and all those things like that to so that way, the only thing that they're focusing on is getting an education. Um, and I think the, the less they have to worry about, the better. And, and so um, really, for instance, in Georgia, we have a, um, a subsidy for childcare. And so it's how do we make sure that that subsidy is fully funded and it's accessible to as many people as possible? Mm -hmm. um, that helps. And, and so all these different other things like access to public transit. So those are, it has to be, uh, I would say, a holistic approach rather than just hey, I give it to you for free kind of thing. Yep, yep, and that's something that we talk about a lot at class. There's no one uh, silver bullet or single policy that can lift people out of poverty and uh, promote opportunity. We need to think about this intersectionally. And so when post-secondary on one side, and you talked about childcare policy, and I know our, our, our ED is a big champion of that. Um, so another question, um, maybe I'll give this to you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, what have you already done, and you talked about this already, but to motivate this cultural shift that our board member David Dodson talked about and change, moving away from this scarcity model, moving away from this legacy of entrenched racism that is deep in our country and, and, and very, very present in the South. What have you done or what are you going to do more to, to, to motivate this shift? Simply tell my story. As 
in communities, most specifically people of color, we have so many stories to tell. And oftentimes in our own communities, we're the only ones that know the story. Tell the story. Speak about what's happening within your community, not only just to you, but what's happening to others in your community as well. Tell the stories, because the stories are the catalyst to moving people to change their hearts and minds. Telling the stories is movement building. Mm. Telling them on social media. Telling them in public forums. But not only that, beyond just telling the stories, the activism, the mobilizing, and yes, I will tell you, it's not enough just to march in the streets. <laughs> it's not, it's important. But you have to move beyond marching in the streets. Sitting at our public forums, going to city council meetings, and demanding that your councilmen and women pay heed to the things that are important to you, be it the PTA meetings, be it every civic engagement kind of forum or event that you can be at, because that's what matters. Most of the shifts and changes and, made, and the things that are made you know, in public policy happen at the state and local level. I can do all that I can do in Washington on a federal level, but you have the power. Tell the story. Hold your state and local and civic leaders, state, local, you know, your state and local legislators and civic leaders accountable to you. Come up with your plans and your programs and your ideas. Put them forth. That you can do. Don't wait just for me to make the change on the federal level. Most of the power lies among you. Yes, and we're glad that we're here, um, here locally. Um, I'm reminded one of a friend and colleague who's in the room um, who does work with Forward Promise, um, um, working on narrative change for boys and men of color, that one of the central tenets of that work, I'm on the National Advisory Committee, is storytelling. And our storytelling and having our young people tell their own stories so that they can, they can change the narrative and they can be the face right, of where they are now and where they want to go. And it's our job to support them as advocates, as policy makers, as, as leaders. So we have one last question, and then we're going to um, wrap it up and uh, turn it over to some partners on the ground from the United Way. Um, a lot of my work is around workforce development and summer jobs and uh, youth jobs and access to our traditional labor market, and that's important. But we know this is an entrepreneurial generation. We also know that many of our folks have been locked out of those traditional jobs because of the criminal justice system. Um, what are your thoughts, very briefly, <laughs> about this tension between training and pathways and traditional education for our um, economy that's current and it's changing, as well as how do we support these entrepreneurial skills and ideas? Um, even this space we're in now was co-founded by young people. Uh, so quickly, I would say even redefining what post-secondary education is or sort of what higher education is. Um, so for instance, uh, locally we have a couple of like carpenters unions and also uh, IBEW in Augusta where if you go through their apprenticeship program, you can make upwards of 30 or $40 an hour and you don't have any debt or anything like that. And so it's like those kind of things is, is I feel like are ways of showing young people like it's not just college, it's not just um, the military, it's there are other opportunities for um, for you to get some sort of post-secondary education. Um, and to me, that's making sure they have access to all of those options. Mm -hmm. Access to all options. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have the final word, Congresswoman? No, I think, I think he said it in a nutshell, making sure that we have access. Access is the key. You can get access, but you have to want to get it. You know, so as I've said before, be empowered. You know, and I, I, I think that, you know, President Obama said it best, you have to be the change that you seek. So you have to be the one to go get it. You know, there are resources out there. There are resources for us. They're, they're <laughs> very quickly being depleted and eroded, but nonetheless, they're still there. And so take full advantage of everything that you're given, take full advantage of every opportunity, take advantage of them. Yeah. So um, join me in uh, thanking our panelists. <laughs> and um, as we transition to uh, 
Katrina Mitchell and um, Daniel Rosebud um, to offer remarks. Uh, you know, I'll offer a challenge to all of us as we are wrapping up and we're going to network and we're going to mingle and we're going to think about what is our charge to do. We have a collective responsibility. We have a, a collective um, uh, responsibility to hold ourselves accountable each other as well as our friends who are elected um, as well as um, folks who may not be our friends, right? So how do we think about that as we go throughout the rest of this evening and moving forward? So once again, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to close us out and really turn it over to Daniel um, to really be able to kind of give the charge. But just tell you a little bit about why United Way is really excited and thrilled to partner with CLASS on this important event. But really being able to think about how do we improve the conditions for the youth, the children and youth in our region. Um, we have nearly half a million children and youth in greater Atlanta, in our region, living in communities of low and very low child well-being. And for us at United Way, this is really about activating leaders to see this differently and to really put young people and children at the center. If we don't know that our children are well, how will others be able to really support those children? For United Way, we've been convening partners focused on improving the outcomes for the more than 90,000 opportunity youth, those young people who are not in school and not working. Our role is really to be able to ensure that we're being able to re-engage them in education and employment pathways that lead to the long-term economic stability. For us, it's important that we, one, continue to expand the services needed for young people, listen to the voices of young people, align those policies that are important, remove those barriers for young adults, and really be able to harness the convening power of our young people. For us, it's important that zip code not be a predictor of a young person's quality of life or success and remind ourselves about the power of young people and their voices in this work. Young people have always been the architects of social change. And I ask you all to remember, where would we be if young people weren't at the center of the civil rights movement? Where would we be if they weren't at the center of the Parkland shooting and the change that happened in Florida? Well, where would they be if they at the center of the work here in our region? So. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel um, because I think for you all, this really comes from not just us saying it, but where do young people believe this work is and just reminding us the power that young people have to make the difference in our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for also having me here today. Uh, just as Katina, Katrina said, it's our job to be intentional. Um, young people have to be at the center of these conversations uh, and at the center of the solutions that we're looking to find to help opportunity youth. Um, as a member of the council, uh, United Way's advisory council, I'm here as a voice for the voiceless, uh, for the ones that are looking for these pathways and are looking for solutions and policies that um, are attainable that also inform systems and shift policy. So again, I want to thank you all for allowing us to be here. Um, me as a young person myself and a portion of the advisory council with United Way. Well, it's my honor, um, deep honor, to be able to close out this amazing afternoon um, everybody here who hasn't had a chance to stand up here and look out over this room, you should come up during the mingling time. Um, for those of you who are watching on the live stream, there's incredible energy here, and it's just, I'm just deeply grateful so many people came. I do want to echo a comment made earlier by our two board members, um, which is really directed at the live stream audience. It is really important that we're having this conversation about young people 
in the South and about the South. And you, there are so many reasons, including the history, but one of the big reasons, speaking as someone who doesn't live in the South, there's no way the United States can have a promising future unless we uplift young people in this region of the country. The next, yes, please cheer. Um, our next generation, the next generation for this country, it lives in Georgia and North Carolina and Florida and Texas and the South. And so all of us, everybody on the live stream has a stake um, in you in this room and your work is our model and is crucial to us. So a few thank yous. First, um, Congresswoman McMath was amazing. I know she had another commitment, but we should thank her again. Um, Ian. You're still here, right? Yes, Ann Bridgeforth. Um, I just want to say that I took so many things from that conversation. Um, just to call out a couple things really quickly. Um, one was just how connected the issues were, right? When you put young people's own needs in the center, you talk about post-secondary education, you get to childcare, you talk about justice, you get to transportation, you get to young children. Part of what we do at CLASP is we try to help make those connections for national policymakers, and we try to help advocates in the states when you need support making those connections in your, in your own state. And I loved Congresswoman McBath's point that you can tell the story and change the narrative from inside and outside. She's doing it in the Congress. There are state legislators, there are county commissioners, there are governors, there are mayors around the country who want that. And so again, part of our job is to be outside and inside, to help people tell those powerful stories when they're ready. But that panel wouldn't have been what it was without our incredible moderator and my colleague, Keisha Bird at CLASS. Um, All of you know her as a friend or a family member, but I get to know her every day as a colleague. She's brilliant, she's inspiring, and she keeps us living up to our standards. Her integrity keeps all of us as an organization moving forward. Thank you, Keisha. Um, I want to thank again our board members, our board chair, Levita Battle, our board members, David Dodson and Jamira Burley. I want to thank our partners. It is incredible that you put this together. And I just want to give a shout out to the class staff who are here and who are watching this event in Washington, DC. Dewey Pham, where's Dewey? There he is, stand up. Um, Marlene Mendoza, stand up. Tom Salyers, where's Tom? Um, Beth Barefoot. Um, and in DC, Mary Faxon, Andy Barris, Barbara Semino, and, Cor and Cormiki Whitley, who've made this happen. So my last charge is to go to the future, to talk to you about what's next. Having heard that incredible charge from the panel of do it, what does it look like out there? Well, first of all, I don't have to tell anybody here that a part of our future, we've talked about 50 years, now we're talking about the next five at least, or 10 on our way to the next 50. Part of that is fighting back. At CLASP, we've been saying the last two years have been the most dangerous for low-income people with attacks on core programs for people of color, for immigrants and their families with the hatred um, of any time in our 50-year history. So there's lots of fighting back to do. We have lots of experience at that. Many of you in this room do. We have victories who here helped protect the nutrition assistance program, SNAP, from being destroyed. Hands here. That's incredibly important. But one of the things that I took away from this panel is that fighting together creates the relationships that make it possible to have a powerful, positive future vision. It's our ability with you as partners, with partners around the country, to be able to say, we fought back, 
We've documented the terrible things, and now we're moving ahead. I, I saw Taifa Butler from Georgia Budget and Policy Institute earlier today. I think she's had to step away. But she said to me, in every speech, I say, don't just document the problems, bring the solutions. And that's what lies ahead for us. I used to work long ago for Marion Wright Edelman, um, daughter of the South, grew up in South Carolina, brought lessons from being a civil rights lawyer in Mississippi to Washington, D.C., and she always said two things that I've always remembered. One is, she always said, you have to make people's lives better day to day, and you have to move a big vision. You should never choose just one of those things. So that's what we both need to do, what we all want to do. And the other thing she said was assign yourself. What she meant by that was just the charge that you just heard. Figure out what it is that you can do to move the agenda forward. We have in your packet a postcard from CLASP. Um, we'd love to have your names. We'd love to be able to continue to partner with you. Um, we need your ideas. We want to support you as you move forward. We want to bring the wisdom of Atlanta and of Georgia to all kinds of places around the country. I'm talking in the next few weeks to advocates and officials in Illinois and in Connecticut and in Alabama um, and nationally. So we want to work with you to make this vision happen. For 50 years, CLASP has been fighting to try to give a voice to people who've been unrepresented. It's what we do well. We feel as though that's, there's a lot we've learned from those lessons, but now's the time to empower the voices of change and the leaders for the future. When we started on this 50th anniversary, I was really worried that in a time of such threats, there would be a trade-off, that we'd be leaving something undone, we'd be failing to protect something, we'd be missing out on a vision because we were busy looking backwards. But what I know now, and what I know from this event, is that the wonderful thing about having a birthday is that you can lift up everybody, all your friends, the voices of your partners, and turn that into an agenda looking forward. So what I hope for from the rest of our anniversary year, you've started it in an amazing way, is that we'll learn, we'll recommit, and that we'll be able to lift up all of you, and together, we'll change the world. Thank you.